can access the PDF that I'll be presenting through that link. So let me share my screen. What I'm going to be presenting today is uh, in regards to a wind tunnel study that was given to us for a project that we worked on a couple of a uh, couple of couple months ago. This was a project located in Portland, Oregon, which uh, I believe the ASC seven designates that area as a special wind zone. Um, so typically for larger buildings in that area, they will have uh, some sort of special wind study. In this case, um, our scope was uh, the glass handrails on the podium of this building. So the, the design team, the architect and the engineer provided a, a wind tunnel report. And uh, what I wanna show in this lessons learned is kind of compare what the uh, code provisions um, Mecca wind uh, what, what the design loads from Mecca Wind, how do they compare to parapet type loads on the different sides of the building? So this, uh, like I show here, the scope of this lesson learned and the scope of uh, our work for this project was the glass handrails that were located in this podium um, along the third through eighth floor. Uh, here are some isometric views of the of the building, and uh, in particular, to 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 simplify uh, this lesson learned, I, I, I'm going to focus only on the eighth floor uh, podium, the the glass handrails that are located in the eighth floor po podium. So here's a little bit of the design criteria listed on the structural drawing sheets. Uh, we got uh, an exposure category B, risk uh, three, with a wind speed of 103 mile per hour. And um, as, as I said before, the, the wind tunnel testing was documented and provided. Uh, so that's what we used for our, for our this. Here is a detail, uh, an elevation view of our guardrails. Uh, so that, to, to use this in the wind, I basically assumed a four foot tall parapet. Um, and here are the mecha wind pressures. Uh, I, I compared both part three and part four due to the building height. Um, we were basically limited to those, those two approaches. Um, what I did in this case is I took my building height at uh, 100 and 25 feet tall, or 124 feet tall, sorry, which is the height, not of the whole building, but just the height of the, the podium at the eighth floor over here. So just to, uh, to try to compare it closely to what that podium was seeing. So uh, using the Mecca Wind chapter, uh, chapter 30, part three of ASC, we're coming up with P net pressures of 78.5. And then similarly using part four, we got you we got even higher pressures of 108.14 PSF for the P net. Now I remember based on ASC7, the P net is the addition of both P1 and P2 for case A or P3 and P4. So uh Mecca when provides you the, the overall design pressure. It does that math for you, I believe. Um, so that those are the pressures that we would have gotten based on the, you know, a, as close as we could um, replicate the conditions of that building. Uh, the, we, we, there's really not, not a good way to have two different heights on Mecca wind. There's not a way to account for any uh, wind shadowing effect that this tall part of the building is going to have on this on, on this podium. So so a good approximation in this case, uh, as I, I will show here in a little bit, might be an overly conservative approximation. So before I dive into the wind tunnel uh, report that was provided, just I uh, wanted to bring up a uh, quick facts about wind tunnel testing. Uh, wind tunnel testing takes into account the, the overall building profile, any geometries on the on the construction and the, and the floor plans. It takes into account the location, the surrounding terrain and landscape, uh, 
and any other buildings around it to approximate the roughness coefficient for the project site. Uh, the models are typically done uh, or built on a 400 to 1 scale and uh, they are instrumented with pressure taps uh, around the model. Um, the accuracy and the number of, uh, of uh, pressure taps depends per uh, the level of accuracy required. Uh, models, models are built on top of a rotating table, allowing the data to be collected uh, uh, from different angles as the table rotates, you, the, the wind direction acting on the building will rotate. Um, and then the rotating table, of course, is set inside a, a wind tunnel. Uh, it offers a significant advantage by uh, simulating the effect of wind on a structure prior to construction. So this would typically happen well before any construction is started. Um, it highlights special hotspots areas on the building profile that are highly affected by wind. And uh, more importantly, it, uh, for, for especially for our clients, for the glazing contractors, uh, it avoids overly conservative assumptions made by code prescribed approaches. Um, it's especially valuable for large, oddly shaped buildings in which uh, cost savings will be substantial due to uh, reduce components and cladding pressures. Uh, so you would probably not see a full wind wind uh, tunnel testing for a for a small you know two story building. It is more uh, the the that you get from from a wind tunnel testing are more uh, tailored for like larger oddly shaped uh, oddly shaped buildings. Um, any question up to this point? Should I proceed? Okay. So uh, this is the uh, the actual uh, wind tunnel report that was uh, provided to us, and uh, it's done by the CPP, uh, which is like a third party uh, testing company. And a few uh, interesting items that I highlighted on the report is um, are shown here. They they list on the report what was the larger largest net pressure the differential. Uh, on the building, the, this was approaching a 90 psf, and I think that was on an area that we didn't have any any guardrails in our scope. Um, and then they say, uh, I think they specify here what the greatest uh, differential pressure for an actual uh, elevation parapet was, which will be shown here graphically in a little bit. Um, so here they they put. Uh, down all the information that's uh, that's b both based on the ASCE and like just the scale model. Uh, they use 649 pressure taps for this particular building, uh, a mean recurrence uh, interval of 1,700 years, which is typical for for most of these tests. And uh, down here, uh, you've got the. The rotating table model, so as you can see, typically not just the building is modeled, but they have this surrounding, like a Portland neighbor, uh, Portland downtown area. They they go out a few blocks on each north, south, east, west direction, and they try to model other, other buildings that might cause some turbulence or wind speeding uh, due to the uh, proximity of these buildings to the to the project that we're looking at, and as I mentioned above, this is an attempt to uh, mimic the roughness on the surrounding uh, terrain and, and landscape. Um, here's a little bit more detail of what the surrounding area shows uh, for other buildings, and then down here is where they listed the pressure. So. What, I, uh, what I've noted here is comparing the code prescribed values that we would get using MechaWind, uh, part three and part four. And in, in some cases, the difference is substantial. Uh, for the south, uh, for the north facing elevation, if we try to accommodate the, 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 ge you know, the geometry of the building and use MechaWind, we would be getting about 100% higher loads or 180% higher loads than what the wind tunnel uh, report has. 
Uh, in some other cases, the difference is uh, smaller, but it's still substantial at about 30% higher. Um, same, same here with the west elevation at the 11th, at, at the eighth floor. Uh, we're seeing substantial savings in, as far as uh, uh, the wind demand on this uh, south elevation. Also, we would we would see some some major changes. Uh, this 65, uh, this 66 psf is what they list on that summary at the beginning of the report as being the highest uh, power pit load. Uh, similarly for the east elevation, where uh, and as you can see, the the sh the wind shading effect, wind shadow effect, sorry, of the of the building uh, tallest section, which is into the page in this image here, it can be seen by by the much lower values uh, shown here on the on on the podium um, facing the east. They list here that what they did. Uh, uh, that for a traditional allowable stress design, the applicable load factors such as 0.06 specified by the appropriate code or standards can be applied. So they're specifying that all these loads are ultimate, that you could apply the 0.6 a, uh, allowable stress design uh, to them to, to bring our, our design pressures to ASD. And uh, they go into a little bit more detail into the technical things of the testing equipment and the and the main mean recurrence interval periods that they use to come up with the with the right like wind speed to be used. And they show here kind of like a schematic of the uh, wind tunnel that they they use for this test. Uh, so they they would put the the rotating table somewhere in here and then just blow blow the the wind at a given velocity to to the model um so as you can see the it, when we get uh, into these larger taller buildings that have uh some some odd uh odd shapes or some discontinuities in their in their geometry um and when they are located in a special wind zone um they would we would typically be uh, be given a wind uh, wind tunnel study report, and as you can see, we we would save a lot of uh, uh, we would see a lot of savings as far as wind 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 load requirement goes. Does anybody have any questions? I don't have any questions. But just two comments. Um, if you go back to page twenty-two. Yeah, this one. Yeah, I just wanted to point out to you, you were explaining the, the turntable. There's also that brown upwind region that they'll change for the different exposure conditions. Um, yeah. I just wanted to point that out for anybody that hasn't seen one of these before or read through one of these reports. And then um, for Portland, it's in a special wind region for 705 and 710, but that's gone away for 716. The governing code for this one, I believe, was the 2010. Right, yeah, so you'd still be in the special region. Yeah. Yeah. But just for the future as we start getting new codes, new projects yeah. coming in. So as far as the, our clients, you know, the, the they would rarely have any say about doing a wind tunnel uh, study or not. However, if, if we are given one, we could we could potentially save a lot of material and, and installation costs by using those redu reduced uh, pressures. But I don't know, Stuart or Quinlivan or, or, or one of the other uh, team leads, have you ever had a client that had the option to request for a wind, wind tunnel study? They're typically brought in so late into the project that it's, it's rare that they would have any say on that, correct? Yeah, I don't really think that we can. <laughs> I don't see a situation where we could request a wind tunnel study and then they go through, get the chamber. I mean, I'm I'm not sure how much that costs. <laughs> but yeah, that would be done done yeah. well before uh, we we were involved. Yeah, and, and that my question wasn't more wasn't like us requesting one, but our clients like our you know one of our bigger clients saying, okay, well. 
we got this bid and the project is still in the design phases. Let's let's try to push for a wind tunnel study, and that would you know bring some considerable savings. But I don't I, I haven't seen any any case like that yet. Yeah. Help me understand both the cost and the savings. Like, do we have an idea about the cost difference between something like this and or doing the engineering outright? And what's the value? Like, are there other cost savings to this aside from just cost of engineering? Are there other materials or other costs to this? Yeah, so, so basically by reducing the, the wind load demand on the building, we can use consider, considerably lower pressures, which means that our design and our approach would be a lot less conservative, which equals less material and less cumbersome installations of like anchorage, some like heavy steel reinforcement. So you could potentially see a lot of material savings and, and labor savings at the back end, but you would have to invest some, some resources in the front end to be able to set up the testing. So I, I don't know if, if there's like a study of, okay, typically wind loads, uh, wind tunnel studies equal an um, X proportion of cost savings. I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's, there's been any, any studies Based on that, but but they they have they have been shown to 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 produce a considerably lower design pressure. There's well, it might something be interesting to have that company do a little uh, pitch to us, a little lunch and learn or something. The and CPP. I'll... Yeah. The, yeah. The code yeah. And as a baseline is designed to be conservative, so doing a wind tunnel study is almost always going to get you a lower value. Um, ASC specifies, I think it's like a 60% reduction off of the code values as a minimum for how well your tunnel can go. So there, there is a bottom to how much savings you're going to get, but it's almost always going to save something. It's just going to be a matter of how much and is it worth spending the couple yeah. grand or whatever it is to do the study versus. Yeah. So, so, and, 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 you know, just looking at this project, Carrie, for example, if, if it's going to cost, you know, five thousand dollars to set up that test with CPP and do it. Just look how much glass there is in this project. So if, if they're having, if they're able to save, you know, a steel bar for every intermediate vertical million, the five dollars is just a drop in the bucket of how much they can save as far as material and installation cost goes for 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 building this size. You know. Hey, yeah. Stuart. Yeah. Do you know? Because I, I still think that there's. <laughs> In order to get one of these done, is is uh, is probably quite a process. Even with just just thinking of the logistics of putting together the model of the uh, of the area with with the different buildings and scaling. Um, yeah. Do you do you have any more info on? I mean, potential yeah. costs on on these. Yeah, they're they're. They're a lot of money. Yeah, you know, I've heard of some that, you know, are eighty to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, to be able to conduct oh, wow. a, a wind tunnel study. Oh wow. So uh, you know, it's a lot of money, but up front, I mean it it not only does it save, you know, potential money associated with cladding, but the main force resisting system as well. You know, yeah. so there's the whole structure can be optimized according to, you know, the wind loads that are produced by the by the study, so there's a there's a heck of a lot of potential for savings. It's just that it it also takes a very long time for them to put together the study, get the report out, and so usually by the time that we enter into the mix, uh, usually there's not a lot of time to be able to get you know a lot of that a lot of that done. We may you know recommend something like that to the client, but I, I would doubt that there would be you know a, enough time in the design process. Uh, for us to be able to, you know, actually see something like that come about. Yeah. You know, what would be good is if the J.A. Janker system would allow us to be further in on the process at the beginning. Maybe this is something that we could recommend in those cases. Yeah. You know, certainly if it's a design build uh, type of a, a, a building and we're brought in on the early parts, there may be some opportunities to to mention that and say that there may be you know, some savings and, uh, but I, you know, whether or not that can actually happen, 
usually by the time that they're involved, the architect and the structural engineer are involved in it, there are already fee agreements associated with it and arrangements for the, you know, the owner. And so that would have to be a, they would really have to go back to the owner and say, hey, you know, if we go this route, we may be able to save, you know, a cost up front, but we may be able to save, you know, a certain amount. So, you know, that's a, that's a lot of, a lot of stuff to be able to get done in a design build uh, arena. But if that's the place to do it, that, you know, it, it has maybe a, a slim chance of being able to happen in a design build. Can you flip back over, Javier, to the east elevation where you were talking about the uh, the wind pressures yep. uh, being reduced? Yeah, right there. <clears throat> so, you know that that's really dramatic. If we if these are ultimate or strength design, and we're able to take those down by 0. 0.6, that's a huge difference from where we were coming up with, you know, 108. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but remember that for the Mecca wind, we basically model just a cube with a four foot carpet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, For for us, whenever we have these wind tunnels, it's uh, studies. It seems like that's a usually a pretty good deal. I've never really seen them this low. Usually, whenever I'm seeing a wind tunnel study, you know, it's it's pretty high for the parapet loads. I mean, decently yeah. high, up around 60. 60. You know, yeah. There, there, there was this one here that yeah. if you see, like, on this direction, on the north-south, there's nothing, like, providing yeah. that wind shadowing. So you have 65 and 66 on those. Yeah. So that, that was interesting to see. So it's because of the wind shadowing that makes it lower? It's yeah complicated <laughs> like the way the, like the way flow wind flows around a building and and it uh, flow dynamics get get very very involved and and it, it it's hard to make a, a blanket statement saying oh yeah if you have a a structure that's going to provide some shadowing effect you will have a lower pressure sometimes it might even speed it up you know, it, that's why they do a tunnel, a wind tunnel study to to be able to pick up all these oddities of the of the geometry. Yeah. So adding to that, um, is there any red flags that um, you know newer engineers uh, should look at when we have these studies to make sure that there's no discrepancy, or should we do similar to what um, Javier did, where we do our own analysis and make and win and compare it, or do we just automatically go with what the report says? Is there any way for us to, to verify it, or is it to the point that once we have it, we just use it? Yeah, usually whenever we have wind tunnel study done in the advanced uh, preliminary design by the by the architect, it comes with a seal, and so they basically indicate that these can be used for the design wind pressures for components and cladding, and so. You know, the design team sends it out as information that we can use for design. And I, you can't really verify it. Yeah. And, and Sam, that's kind of what I, I, I did just for this lesson learned. Say, okay, let, let me try to verify it and see if I can come anywhere close. And as you can see, we were like two or two and a half times higher <laughs> than the load. So if we go back to our client and say, no, I mean, we're coming up with 108 PSF loads. We're going to have to use that. He's going to take that to the architect and EOR. And they're going to say, well, no, we spent you know, $50,000 in this study, particularly for that reason, <laughs> because we don't want to have to be overly conservative. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard for us to replicate those values. Uh, and like Stuart saying, you know, th this this CPP report is prepared by by a professional engineer uh, uh, that represents CPP, so that becomes uh, uh, basically usable pressures. Like the on page four of Javier's PDF, that clip from the structural drawings, it actually references the report and says, "Hey, use this." Yep. For yep. your pressures. So anytime we do have a tunnel report, just use it. It was done for a reason. It's going to give you better values, all that fun stuff. So, 
Um, one thing to be very careful about, though, is the language of allowable versus ultimate, ASD versus ultimate that they use in the report, because that's not always going to be consistent between providers. Yeah, I think we ran into that on Kyle's Peachtree project a couple of months ago, where we actually went back and asked them to clarify what their wording actually meant. Did they include factors? Did they not? Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna mention that Ryan. Yeah. We actually called the laboratory up in Canada who did the wind load study on that to get some clarification on how they worded stuff. Um, and I asked them some additional questions just to get some background knowledge on this stuff. The guy I talked to is the assistant manager for the lab at the university who has the the wind load or the wind tunnel testing laboratory. They do. They have four active projects a year, and they do two tests per year. He said, it, on average, it takes about six months from the day it's initiated to the day it's actually tested to get a project going. Because it's not just this is what our building is. They then have to go and get the building sizes for every single structure around it for a certain distance from the actual structure. And everything has to be cut out of styrofoam. Um, they're actually getting into the 3D printing phase and whatnot. And he said just doing all of that takes time. And then at the very end of the project, they go through with the city planners and make sure that there's no new structures that could be being built in the foreseeable future that could alter um, the design for the future. So he said they test twice a year but they typically have four active projects where they're getting all that reference information to actually produce the models that are going to then be tested. So it's very costly. If you're, only, if you're running a big laboratory and only have four active projects a year, I'm assuming that's very costly. <laughs> Whoever's getting it done. Many, many times uh, in the, in the past, whenever I've seen wind tunnel studies, they have dates on them that are, you know, a couple years in advance of, uh, you know, design documents being produced by the architect and engineer of record. Hey, Ryan. I have a question for you. Oh. Hey, yeah. hey um, when I was in my master's degree, uh, I have a German teacher that said in German, there's a, in Germany, there's a law that when a new building is constructed in a, in a place there are too many buildings you have to do a wind uh, tunnel analysis not only to obtain the wind pressures for your building but to check the wind pressures for the buildings that are nearby the, the one that your analysis because it may change the pressures for the wind and change the the, the way that the the, the the oldest buildings work is that uh, a law in the United States? Well, <clears throat> let me speak to that. I've never heard of that being the case in the United States. Uh, that's an interesting concept because, yes, because, you know, the dynamic flow around buildings. Uh, has anybody see, has anybody seen a uh, one of these wind tunnel studies being conducted in a video with the uh, the smoke trail? Yeah, yeah I've seen it. a few people. If you haven't seen it done before, I really encourage you to you know kind of go out there on the on the internet and kind of look at one of these with a with a smoke trail. It's and it's like fluid. You know, it's it, it is essentially fluids. The study of fluids whenever you have uh, you know this type of a, a study going on, and so it can be interrupted and changed around. Other buildings, so I see that as a very real item. One that uh, you know that that may it may get into the United States in some areas into the code. I'm surprised that it's not in you know in some of the major cities like New York City. But uh, ultimately, whenever they're putting in a tall building, anyway, it's a common practice. Usually, they're doing a, a wind tunnel study, and I think that that's you know, required by the city in some way, but I haven't seen it actually in uh, any of the uh, the code requirements yet. 
also us I, I was doing a little bit of uh digging about like the the supporting you know articles and stuff that kind of like cover this and i stumbled upon this i don't know if uh Stuart, uh have you ever read any of these journals journal of wind engineering and industrial aerodynamic they're journals put together by the wind and engineering well but by the international association for wind engineering and they published these journals and i was digging a little bit uh like on their october 2020 uh volume they go into very interesting subjects such as uh i saw one for a tornado uh tornado like vortex induced wind pressure on a low rise building with openings in roof corners now most of this you, i think all of this you have to purchase them but uh they have a lot of very interesting topics uh like wind pressure coefficients for buildings with air curtains so it it's a really really uh deep resource that they go into very specific things there's some like solar solar panel uh studies of how wind affects the solar panels for for when they're installed close to the ground when they're in the roof so this is a really uh, good tool resource to have if if uh you know, if, if we have any uh, free time or downtime, it might be interesting to to dive into some of these. Um, now, the thing is that some of them you have, I think all of them you have to purchase them. Um, so um, on the purchase stuff, sometimes you can find copies via like Google Scholar from the author's websites. They'll yeah. Free. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll share this uh, this link of this journal on the group on the team chat. So that uh, somebody has some downtime if they, they want to dive into the uh, into some of these topics, it'll be it'll be nice. Uh, 